Thank you very much. I have no disclosures to make. The brain is supplied by two arterial systems, anterior supplied by the internal carotid and posterior supplied by the vertebral arteries. Damage to the vertebral artery can cause serious symptoms. Fortunately, vast majority of these injuries are asymptomatic. This is because we are blessed with two vertebral arteries. If one vertebral artery is injured, the contralateral side can supply the posterior circulation. However, in about 25% patients, one of the vertebral artery is hypoplastic and in this situation, if the dominant vertebral artery is injured, collateral flow can be established from the anterior circulation via the circle of villus. And the main connection between the anterior and posterior circulation at the circle of villus is the posterior communicating artery. But it is important to know that there is a great amount of variation at the circle of villus. In a Japanese study, a significant number of patients had no communication between the anterior and posterior circulation. This has serious implications if the dominant vertebral artery is injured and the anterior and posterior circulations are separate. Now let's look at the vertebral artery course. It is divided into four parts. V1 is from its origin in the subclavian to its entry into the C6 transverse foramen. V2 is from the C6 transverse foramen to its entry into the C2. V3 is from the C2 to the point where it enters the dura and V4 is the intradural part of the vertebral artery. Our main concern in spine surgery is the V2 and the V3 segment and we are going to discuss these two regions. Let's see the V2 segment first. The entry of the VA into the cervical spine can be variable. As we have seen most commonly it is C6 but if it is higher then some of the vertebral artery is unprotected and lies outside the bony confines of the transverse foramen where it can get injured during anterior cervical approach. In about 5% of patients the entry is at C5 and it is very rare for the entry to be at C4 or C3. To detect this one has to look carefully at the foramen in axial scans. Diameter of the foramen increases from C3 to C6 C7 is normally the smallest foramen. An unusually small C5 transverse foramen like this should alert the surgeon that the VA is outside. On a plain MRI scan, also one might be able to detect the VA out of the foramen. Sometimes the VA will enter the cervical spine at C7 in about 1-5% to of cases. This is important to know for preoperative planning for a C7 osteotomy. Another anomaly in the V2 segment are loops. Medial loops can be dangerous. Depending on the level, medial loops can be at the disc level where it can get injured during discectomy or foramenotomy or they can be at the vertebral body level. At the body level, if they go unrecognized, one can easily damage it during a corpectomy. A careful examination of axial images at the body level even on an MRI will reveal an eccentric transverse foramen like this. This should prompt a detailed anatomical evaluation of the vertebral artery if an anterior surgery is planned. The most common mistake in an anterior approach that can lead to VA injury is the loss of midline orientation where the surgeon keeps digging far to the opposite side to where he or she is standing. This should be avoided at all costs even if there are no medial loops. Also, one has to be careful while doing an anterior oncoforaminotomy. The VA is about 5 mm lateral to the lateral aspect of the disc. In patients with severe uncus hypertrophy, the dissection can lead right up to the VA as seen here. So, one has to be careful in using curate or burr in the foramen. Coming to the V3 segment, it is divided into three parts. V1 is from the entry into the C2 pars till its exit from the C2 foramen transversarium. This part notches the undersurface of the C2 superior facet and lies in what is called as the vertebral artery cave. V2 is from the exit from the C2 foramen till it enters the C1 transverse foramen and V3 is from the C1 transverse foramen to its entry into the dural sac. Coming to the V1 segment. In this segment, we are looking for a high riding vertebral artery in the vertebral artery cave underneath the C2 superior facet. In a parasagittal view, the internal height is the top of the vertebral artery cave to the superior facet 
and the isthmus height is from the vertebral artery cave to the dorsal surface of the pars or the isthmus. Vertebral artery cave is too tall if the internal height is less than 2 mm and in this situation it is still possible to pass a transarticular screw. But sometimes the cave is also posteriorly located. If the isthmus height is less than 5 mm, a transarticular screw can be a dangerous screw. Sometimes the high riding vertebral artery is also too medially located such that it notches the C2 vertebral body making even C2 pedicle screws dangerous. In the V2 segment, one has to look for anomalous courses that might make it dangerous to insert C1 lateral mass screw or when C2 ganglion is cut for facet joint manipulation. Persistent first intersegmental artery is one which travels underneath the C1 arch rather than over it. Less commonly, the VA is both above and below the C1 posterior arch and this is called a fenestrated VA. Sometimes the origin of the pica is anomalous and is below the C1 posterior arch and injury to this vessel can cause a cerebellar infarct. In this example you can see a persistent first intersegmental artery which was recognized pre-op and therefore C1 screw was avoided. One trick to identify this is to look at the C1 transverse foramen. If rudimentary and there is a deep groove on the inner side of the C1 arch then the VA is coursing below the C1 arch. This is an indirect evidence of such anomalies. In the V3 segment, we know that dissecting more than 1.5 cm of the midline on the superior border of the C1 arch can be dangerous. In about 15% of patients, that there is a bony bridge over the V3 segment called the ponticulus posticus. It can be recognized on lateral x-rays where you can see the arcuate foramen. This is relevant when putting a C1 posterior arch screw as an alternative to C1 lateral mass screw. The entry point for this screw is the posterior arch and if the anomaly is not recognized, the screw can injure the vertebral artery. So which investigations should be done for studying the VA? While a CT angiogram is not necessary for the usual ACDF corpectomy or lateral mass fixation, a detailed assessment using angiogram should be done for craniovertebral surgeries or cervical pedicle screw fixation. In addition, for planning of screws, one has to look at images in line with the screw trajectory using MPR. For this, images can be manipulated using a DICOM software and we have found that this gives more information than looking at films or PAX images. How to do this is described in detail in our published paper. Finally, Remember that conditions such as congenital anomalies, tumors, tuberculosis, rheumatoid arthritis can distort the anatomy and the vertebral artery may become more vulnerable to injury in these situations. Thank you very much for patient listening.